I am very excited to introduce our speaker, uh, Han Liang. Dr. Liang is a professor and senior scientist at uh, MD Anderson. He's the deputy chair of bioinformatics and computational biology there. Um, he's somebody that I've been interacting with for like eight to 10 years through large cancer genomics consortia. Uh, we've always gotten along, maybe because we both got our undergrads in chemistry. He did his at PKU in Beijing, followed by a PhD in computational biology at Princeton a uh, pretty brief postdoc at U Chicago, and he's been at MD Anderson for 12 years ever since. He's been central to major projects, particularly the PCTA, but also driving a whole series of really interesting work in artificial intelligence and other areas, and it's a real delight to have him speaking with us today. I'm okay, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. It's always enjoy I talk to you. And then um, today it's really my great pleasure to give this um, talk on my recent work. So uh, I will talk about a little bit artificial intelligence and how that will be used for analyze big omics data. And then find talk a little bit about cancer system. So ABC. Um, so here is my disclaimer. Mm. So as you all know, we are in a very exciting time of big data. And in the last 10 years, there's quite a bit, all kinds of, especially at NGS, there's a genome, whole genome, uh, exome, proton, transcriptome, and more recently, there's a single cell sequencing. So we see this uh, great opportunity really to get every details in uh, disease, in cancer, and use those molecular details to guide us for precision therapy. So um, as Paul mentioned, um, I have been working on uh, the Cancer Genome Metalis product in the last 10 years. As you know, this probably is the most expensive product uh, in, uh, by NCI. So this product basically generates comprehensive molecular data for more than 11,000 patients uh, over 33 cancer type. So for the same patient um, cohort, they generate this parallel data from uh, whole exome mutation, SNP array copy number, RNA-based gene expression, um, array-based DMSolation, a microRNA-seq, and also um, reverse phase protein array-based protomics data, and also CNU data. So this represents very rich resource for us to really digest um, the characteristic molecular basis of cancer. And then um, in the 2018, we run up the whole product. And then um, we have published a bunch of pan-cancer analysis paper in uh, cell and cell-related journals. So, and also in this um, cell um, perspective, we mentioned, I mentioned that TCGA essentially put bioinformatics and the computational biology in the driver's seat of cancer research. So it's really changed our paradigm from this hypothesis. Somebody may think about the individual gene generates a hypothesis, really changes paradigm to that big data driven uh, research. So, but actually that's not only uh, TCGA. Later you have a lot of many new big data sites. So like the International Cancer Genome Consortium, actually Paul and I both involved in this ICGC, um, where we analyze more than uh, nearly 3000 whole genome sequence data. And then there's a 1000 genome and then you know, uh, UK have this nearly half billion, a uh, half million people biobank data, and then we also have this uh, all of us, um, one million people precision medicine initiative. So what we see is huge data explosion, and then this also presents quite a bit of challenge in understanding this data, how to uh, translate this big data into um, clinical insight, try to improve and. Imp uh, translate to improvement of patient care. So, so I guess in order to digest those big data, we need two things. Number one, we really need a um, effective, intelligent bioinformatics tool. Number two, we want to some new analytical concept beyond conventional uh, gene-based analysis. So that's really the focus of my talk today. So um, I want to quickly mention a little bit of background overview of my lab. So my lab really work on the intersection between three domains, 
One is by informatics. Over the years, my group published a bunch of paper um, help people to analyze large cancer genome data from uh, the cancer proteomics entities. That's really RPP-based functional proteomics data portal and TARIC long non-coding RNA. And more recently, and today I focus on that Dr. BioWright. So the goal of this part is really empower a big community to more easily analyze big data sites. The second part of my group is really focus on pan cancer analysis through the TCGA and ICGC. When you have the same data set generated across many cancer types, we can do this comparative analysis, really ask the same question to understand what's the general principle um, conserved across cancer type and also to understand cancer specific um, uh, things. For example, we start from pseudogene, RNA editing, uh, sex effect, um, hypoxia, uh, more recently is mitochondrial uh, uh, genome. So today, for this part, we are going to focus on enhancer analysis. So the goal for this is really try to characterize the molecular basis of cancer. Um, the third part in my group is really, um, we develop a lot of high throughout functional perturbation approach. So using this approach, we can analyze the functional effect of the driver mutation. For example, we uh, systematically assess the functional consequence of each out of 1000 mutation in cell viability and drug response. More recently, we also do the similar thing to see uh, what's the RPP-based uh, drug combination. So the goal of this section is really try to, using functional genomic approach, try to identify a uh, novel therapeutic target and new combination therapy. So, so today, um, as I mentioned, at first we'll talk about this uh, Dr. BioWright. So this is a conversational um, AI-driven analytics for omics data. So when we talk about, um, there's a quite a bit of challenge in big data analysis. You know, when we talk about the big data, there are quite a bit um, technical barrier for people to use different bioinformatics tool. Um, this particular tool for some people who primarily work on bench don't really have much uh, computational expertise. It's very hard for them to use all kinds of tools. Second one, there's a huge diversity in terms of data. You have whole genome, transcriptome, epigenome, single cell, metabolic, mass spec. And also even for the same analysis, there could be many different algorithms. Say we want to call a different gene, there's more than a dozen of algorithms to call a differential gene between two groups of sample. And the third one is the whole field is just moving so fast, you know, you spend quite a bit of time learning certain tools, certain algorithm. Very soon, there's a new one came out. You always want to track the best one. So don't mention there's a quite a bit of challenge in terms of you gather the data, big data storage management. So there's a quite a bit of uh, challenge. So I do, so you probably know, um, there's many paper, uh, there's a quite a bit of concern about reproducibility in uh, biomedical research, especially those results uh, in oncology. So there are quite a bit of efforts try to reproduce the results publishing uh, top journals. So ideally, we want to get a platform. Number one, we want to minimize the communication bar between user and the data. Uh, number two, we really want to remove the black box, make the whole process transparent and uh, reproducible. So people not only get the result, and also they know what's the uh, detail behind that result. Third one, uh, we want to make this platform open development. So you engage the whole community to contribute to different tool, different algorithm. Um, lastly, probably most important one, we want to make the platform can make improvement, consistent improvement based on the user feedback and the user data. Uh, user data. So, Based on these principles, in the last three years, my group actually uh, really worked hard to make this uh, tool called Dr. Barrett. This is a natural language oriented analytic platform. Um, so you can see there are two uh, key things. Number one is really it's natural language. You don't need to learn anything. You just talk to Dr. Barrett, like talk to a friend. Second one, this is AI driven platform. 
they automatically use users' data, users' feedback to improve the performance. So uh, we can show you a little bit demo. So for example, this Dr. Barry Wright essentially used this uh, uh, dialogue um, format. Uh, there's an input area, you just type a question. When you, like you talk to a friend, for example, you can ask how many cancer types do you have in TCGA? And then Dr. Wright essentially understand your question as you confirm this. And then if you say, yes, that's what you need, um, Dr. Wright will understand the question, identify the data set, show you the result. For example, here, just show you not only the cancer type in TCGA, but also show you the sample size. So you can easily also save those results. You can also save those results. You can also save the result. And then remember, uh, you can, you can further uh, type a question, say, could you do a correlation analysis? Um, do a correlation analysis between two genes. For example, you're interested in P10 and then the BMPI2 gene uh, in, in TCGA, breast cancer. So when you type this question, um, essentially, in that case, you did not mention which data type you're looking for. Dr. Ray Wright will ask you, so you say, okay, I'm interested in gene insertion. And then Dr. Ratz asks you to confirm this question. You want to see the correlation of co expression between these two genes. And then you ask you to confirm, you know this result immediately. And then you get this scatter plot. You see, indeed, there's a strong particle correlation between these two genes. And then you can easily download this. Um, and also remember, there's a rate to give us a feedback. If you think the result is cool, you give a good. If result you have some concern, you can leave too bad, then there's a way you can input. So you can also ask a question, say, um, how about a differential analysis on uh, TNF gene in um, TNF uh, F gene and the gender? So in that case, you're interested in whether that gene show differential expression uh, in, in TCGA kidney cancer. When you specify this, um, Dr. Wright will ask you again, confirm the question. Then they will generate this kind of figure. You see in kidney cancer, uh, there's a much, the female show much higher expression of that gene. And then you can download this uh, very quickly. And then um, one more example. So you can say, please do a survival. Uh, yeah, you can do a over survival analysis of TP53 mutation. I see. In breast cancer. So in this case, you may not specify which, uh, which data type. So Dr. Wright will check their local, tell you, uh, ask you to see which data set you want. Say you want to TCGA. In that case, you confirm this, and then you can quickly get a um, Kaplan-Meier curve. So from this curve, you can see a uh, high TP53 mutation indeed show a much um, worse prognosis. And then you can give a uh, feedback about this. So you also can uh, generate um, some more complicated uh, work. For example, could you do a lolliplot? In this case, you're interested in uh, mutation distribution in a gene. So say, could you do a lolliplot uh, in TCGA um, kidney cancer? So if you confirm your work, we'll have this kind of lolliplot in a second. So what I show you here, um, you can also, this is interacting uh, figure. So you can see all the uh, detail and also you can uh, read. So this, a few examples have to show you that for a lot of analysis, you can directly talk to Dr. Bright to generate this kind of figure. Of course, um, we may ask whether you want to can do some more complicated work. So Dr. Wright not only using those higher level, they also can process the data from the beginning. For example, uh, in this case, you may be interested to analyze some um, omics data. So you, you want to do mutation calling, for example. 
And then um, you have, say, suppose you have whole exome data. Then what you need to do, say, could you do a mutation calling? And then Dr. Radi will say, okay, they will ask you whether it's a single tumor or you have a match tumor and you see match. And in this case, they ask you provide a location. So for example, the data, the BAM data, you, uh, the FASTQ data available in that um, SRA, you just provide the ID. And then um, they will ask you a few questions about the match the normal sample, you provide another ID, and then you can specify, um, is this a tissue type? Say this is a colon colorectal cancer, I can name your product, say this is um, Asperg. Then you confirm this is what you want to do, commutation using match the sample. Uh, in that case, because this will take quite a bit of time, um, Dr. Bell Wright will coordinate the uh, high throat cluster uh, to do the work. So you can take a break, uh, enjoy a cup of coffee. When this um, job done, Dr. Bell Wright will either invite you back or um, send you email. So after that, your job is finished. You can, they will provide you this kind of uh, detailed coding report where you can see this report will show you every detail. In this case, we show you, we're using um, GATK best practice pipeline. And then uh, first they gave you some summary about this sample data you use. Uh, that include the uh, feature count, how many, uh, what's the number of the rates, and then you also look at for the uh, QC, for example, you see the fast Q QC percentage, the number of the rays, if that and the, Duke, the uh, sequencing quality score generates a bunch of that score, you can this, you can, for all those figures, you can easily download that uh, in, it's further that in uh, image on Excel file for your own uh, analysis. So you have this um, base quality and then the um, sequencing content and the GC, GC content uh, figure. So you also have this um, base quality. So that's basically give you quite a bit um, standard metrics for you to assess the result, um, whether the sample have good enough rates, sequence quality. So everything, if this everything looks good, um, you can potentially, uh, you will get this uh, higher level uh, mutation calling data. So, uh, so for here, you can also see what's the rays map to different chromosome. Uh, you can see uh, what's the map of the rays. And then you can also decide to, um, what's the normalized rays count cross chromosome. Everything again, you can download. And then after you make sure that everything fulfill what you, um, that you have this VCF, the table, which contain the uh, chromosome location, the base reference, the mutation calling. And then uh, you also can sort this. So basically when you have this kind of data, uh, you, you also can choose a uh, different format. For example, you can use MAF. So for this traditional mutation calling job, you can just simply initiate and finish that in a few seconds. So, so this is of course, it just uh, tell you Dr. Brian Wright, not only do some uh, higher level analysis, also can run some base pipeline, as long as you have this pipeline installed in your platform. And then Dr. Wright also can do things is help you check the reproducibility of the paper. For example, uh, this is a paper published by Microstratum Group and Sanger Institute. So where they generate a uh, whole genome sequencing of breast cancer uh, in 560 patients. So uh, in this, this is a classical cancer genome paper where they generate some figure. Um, they show some um, distribution of substitution in there in different sample. They also uh, identify some driver mutation uh, using uh, mutation rate. And then they perform some uh, mutation signature analysis. They even identify, uh, study some link RNA distribution, mutation distribution. So this is figures published in this paper. And then after this data load into the TCGA, uh, sorry, into the Dr. Biorite, essentially you can uh, quickly reproduce those results by simply ask Dr. Wright um, the question, say, could you do the mutation count? And uh, then could you um, identify the driver gene? So on the right side, you see that's the data, we, that's the figure we generated using the same data set. 
So you get exactly the same, um, almost perfect match between what's published. So that's also indicate that when you have this intelligent tool, um, you have much powerful way to reproduce and publish the result. So when we have this, um, so what we did here is, uh, this is the overall workflow. So when you first user talk to a sentence, um, Dr. Barrett essentially first using NLP processing to identify the keyword in your sentence. And then given this input, we build a uh, network prediction model to predict what's the user intention. Uh, after that, once we confirm user intention, uh, Dr. Barrett will identify the appropriate data and then call the corresponding work, uh, analysis script. And then they will check whether you provide all the sufficient parameter to perform that function. If not, they will ask the user to provide the additional parameter. After we confirm we need all the information, then Dr. Wright will decide whether given to the job, we have this smart job scheduler that either for some simple job, maybe you're just using local browser to computing. For some large computing, say NGS based pipeline processing, we probably use some cloud computing and then we can submit the job and then we collect all the results, display the result in a appropriate um, visualization module. And then when we return that uh, result to the user and ask the user to give us feedback, then we can using those feedback to further um, help in, improve the model. So this actually is the um, baseline. So in our platform, we make this framework very flexible. So we have this um, bioinformatics tool. They can written in different language. They are Python on uh, Java. And then we have this module ramper. So the performance is largely independent from computing environment. And then we can have the, so one we can easily always increase this kind of module. So far we have, um, install many uh, common um, analysis module. For example, for mutation analysis, also we have this um, complex heat map. Uh, you can easily see global pattern of omics data. And also this is um, interactive. So you can zoom in, zoom out through uh, next generation heat map developed by our department. We have this pathway network analysis. And also we have the single cell analysis can easily uh, do t map um, subtype classification. We also can do this pan cancer analysis when you have TCGA, you also have this all kind of statistical um, analysis. So, so far with this kind of module, one can always contribute a new module to this so people can use that. So in future, what we going to do is we are going to number one, we're going to add many more cohort, uh, not only from TCGA, CCLE, but also many large data source uh, we have and then we have this harmonized data set. We are going to introduce more pipeline where um, you not only have one choice, you also have other choice. So you can do mutation, RNA level, protomics, even a uh, single cell, mass spec. So the next step we try to do is try to um, not only show the result, but also try to interpret the result in the context of literature. So one thing which we can do is we load billions of literature content um, abstract into the database. And then when you have results, Dr. Bagrat will tell you whether this pattern already been reported in literature or this result contradict in certain uh, report pattern. So the next one we are working on is try to make this more social interaction. So, so far you can talk to Dr. Wright by either text or you can direct it to voice. Um, we also going to have this um, make everything presumably fit in this um, smartphone. So by using smartphone, we can also do this uh, group chat. So you're not only to talk to Dr. Bar Wright one by one, you can initiate this group chatting. So Dr. Wright just, uh, Bar Wright just one uh, guest in that room. So why you have group, people to discuss, uh, you can always ask Dr. Wright to generate some result immediately facilitate that discussion. And then you have this um, 
we also going to increase security. So while you using your account login, you can not only access the public data, you can also access the data sets available to your own institution on the info own group. So depends on your uh, security level, you can have enjoy using different data sets to do separated on joint together analysis. And more importantly, I want to mention that a fundamental difference between uh, our study and also other um, bioinformatics tool is at this, this moment you think, okay, the Dr. Barrett seems only do some routine regular analysis, but because the more user use, we essentially using the user feedback and the user data to constantly improve the underlying model to um, more and more accurate. Eventually, they could become very knowledgeable, very capable analyst. And also this analyst ne never forget anything. Always uh, do this thing for your seven days, 24 hours. So this really, um, so if you think, um, so that's, so we published this paper early this year in Cancer Cell. Um, after that, um, this got quite a bit of media attention. For example, uh, like they all realized that AI <clears throat> reached the moment can lower the bar for big data in medical research. And then especially um, next generation Python tool can enable people to do analysis without programming expertise. Um, they also, sometimes they have this different opinions say, for example, this paper, they mentioned are computational biologists losing their job. So, well, I, I think the thing is we are in a time full of all kinds of innovation. They probably have, we, our generation have this new uh, exciting funding every day, much faster pace than any previous generation. So what we need to do is always adapt to this new technology. Um, so you can imagine when we have this Dr. Bell right, they essentially can empower us to do a lot of analysis or even change the new research paradigm. So for example, you can imagine um, personally people do analysis more like they think out the question, then they either do some analysis and then do some experiment data, then report that through literature. But now you can imagine new research paradigm where you can start uh, research by talk to Dr. Uh, Barrett on similar intelligent tool, they will quickly generate this raw data using already existing data. And then they can also help you check the reproducibility of your hypothesis, uh, the results, and then um, discuss the results in the context of literature. And then you can, through this platform, invite different people to contribute to a product. Say algorithm developer maybe contribute a new algorithm, data scientists maybe provide an independent data site to test your hypothesis. Cancer um, biologists maybe help you to interpret the pattern you observe. And then once you generate this, get this, you get a better understanding of your hypothesis. Maybe you can um, connect this through a more um, self-governing system, say robot in um, lab. So they could automatically generate a new data set. So this new data set will further fit in into this uh, intelligence tool. So essentially you go to this uh, positive loop. So that's pr presumably a much better way to uh, increase our efficiency. So what I'm saying is now I view scientific research is a co-investigation between human and the AI agent rather than something people are doing with some AI driven the tool. So that's a fundamental distinction between you use some tool versus you think that the AI robot as your equivalent partner co-study some product. So that's really, I think we are in the transition to this critical in this moment. So um, I think this section, I want to mention that we developed this Dr. Van Wright, the first conversational AI omics, um, data for omics data. That's really featured by natural language understanding. So you can talk to Dr. Barrett, right, just like talk to your bioinformatician. Um, they're really using um, artificial intelligence to improve the way we understand your sentence found at the better data site. 
And then we make this everything result transparent by not only provide the result, but also provide you this kind of analytical report. And then we make these things on the mobile phone. So in future, you don't do things on your computer cluster, do your desktop, you really do this through your smartphone, iPhone. And then this is based on social media. So a lot of people can collectively can work together on the same problem. So I think that's make data analysis more intuitive, efficient, transparent, and collaborative. Yes, so this is really about the first part. And then um, now I want to skip, skip the gear a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, big data analysis. So it's actually about enhancer um, RNA analysis. So our analysis, our pan cancer analysis, essentially, it's like pyramid. We first need to get a better understanding about the genome structure. Once we have this knowledge, we can get better understanding about the genome biology. And then on top of that, we probably have a deeper understanding about the disease biology. After that, we could develop some clinical application. So we really have fundamental better understanding of a genome structure help uh, our uh, top level research in tremendous way. So as you know, enhancer is a very important uh, regulatory element. It's a key class non-coding regular elements. How this um, in the linear space, enhancer may be far away from their target gene, but then in the 3D structure, enhancer usually close to the target gene promoter, and then uh, help recruit the transcription factor. Therefore, enhance increase the target gene expression. So importantly, that enhancer um, one day really have um, activation state, the nucleosome fault, this whole region become accessible. They also generate some RNA, short RNA transcripts. So those RNA called enhanced RNA, or we can call it ERA. So um, study show that ERA signal can be used as a way uh, to quanti as a readout for enhanced activity. So we believe this is very important because for large patient cohort, you cannot really perform chip seek uh, analysis, right? Either become the sample just too valuable to do that. Remember, also chip seek have still technical difficult and very sensitive. But RNA data actually quite um, universal. So and also cheap, cheap. So we are interested in how can we quantify ER signal from um, this. So in 2008, at that moment we used the TCGA. But the, the difficult thing is we don't know the exact location for ER locus. So uh, that moment we use a phantom where they use a cage seek um, to quantify, to really capture ERA. So based on the cage seek, we can um, quantify ERA signal. So um, we using apply this um, cage seek annotation, quantify only 15,000 ERA signal uh, in nearly 10, uh, 9,000 TCG pan cancer. And then uh, from there, we develop a um, integrative, integrative approach to identify ER signal and the regula regulation on gene. So uh, when you have a, briefly, when you have ER, ER signal and the gene, um, if they are really have regulation, they show co-expression pattern, but they may or may not really represent the causal effect. So we, turn this pin causal effect, we further borrow the EQTL signal because when you kill um, causal effect, the SNP in ERA will show some EQTL signal on the gene. But in the reactive, if the ERA is regulated by the gene or on ERA in the gene co-regulated by third party, you would not see this kind of uh, EQTL signal. So we can, based on that principle, we can first through TCGA, we build this ERA gene co-expression identify code certain pair, and then we further integrate in the southern genome on GTAC EQTL signal to identify causal enhancer gene regulation. And then we have further incorporate a high seq loop data to identify direct causal enhancer gene regulation. And then based on this kind of systematic study, we can build this um, ERA gene uh, regulatory network. In this network, each ERA is a box and then um, each gene, especially subunit target, represents an uh, own. And you can see 
Uh, one important gene we found is PDL1, that's a major therapeutic target. And we found that there's a chromosome 9, um, there's an enhancer regulated the PDL1 150K away from the gene. And then we can further validate that enhancer by using CRISPR. Uh, given cell line using CRISPR, we can knock out that specific enhancer 9 region. And then after that, indeed, you see um, there's a dramatic re reduction of um, messenger and also messenger protein expression of PDL1. So this effect is even strong when you have interferon gamma inhibit. So based on that, we can further study the um, chip seq data in the promoter region, the enhancer region. Um, basically, we came up with this um, model where uh, we believe the NF kappa B form a dimer bring this enhancer 9 close to PDL1 promoter, therefore uh, turn on the PDL1 expression. So this just give you one example uh, when we have this enhancer detailed enhancer regulation, we could have better understanding about the uh, regulation of important gene. However, this is only a partial problem because the, face, uh, the phantom only have very small number only about 15,000 um, measurable ERA signal. Um, especially for big region like a super enhancer in human, you cannot really measure ERA signal. So as you know, super enhancer, um, when Richard Young first proposed this idea that super enhancer region really uh, play the important role in the control of cell identity and the disease. So um, when they have this, um, chip seq data across the whole genome, you see certain region where you have quite a bit of chip seq signal. And then this kind of region basically called um, super enhancer region. They have very big region full of this kind of um, enhancer unit. So for such kind of big region, uh, you almost no way to, you know, here just give you, you, you can see certain peak, but usually if you look at the resolution, you have several KB together. When you have such a big region, you have no way to directly quantify uh, the ERA because ERA signal generally is very weak. When you have a big region, there's a lot of background transfer noise in that region. You just have no way to get accurate ERA signal. So what we really do um, is really um, build a high resolution map. So this is through working with my postdoc, Han Chen, very talented postdoc. And then uh, what we do is we first um, get that super enhancer region, a core super enhancer region. And then we can um, superimpose that uh, hundreds of sample together, define uh, that uh, enhancer expression map. And then based on that, we can um, further leverage data set, um, identify independent enhancer ER unit. And then we can also incorporate the uh, IPG9 data to identify the global pattern. And then we can do all kinds of downstream application. So for example, when we have this 100 sample together, lump together, you have ultra deep RNA-seq data. When you have this RNA-seq data, if you look at uh, this landscape, you immediately rec recognize there have some very sharp peak this peak have um, local small peak. So those peak actually have um, quite con conserved cross cancer type. So for example, for this 600 region, basically we can see five different peak. So some peak, and then this um, peak only have 100 uh, base pair. And then uh, we do this for core set of super enhancer region, meaning the super enhancer region, they are consistent identified across different tissue. And then um, based on that, we can find uh, those peak location is quite conservative cross cancer type. You see they almost have no um, nucleotide, only one or two nucleotide shift. So this kind of position also confirmed um, by using independent um, g -text. So when we have 10,000 g tags and seq data, you also can do the same thing. You ask whether you see such kind of recurrent um, peak, short peak uh, in certain genome location. Indeed, we found this location. And then if you found those ER peak, 
And then you super together, you found such a kind of peak, they only about 100 base pair long. And then they can show up sharp, very sharp peak. And then they quickly uh, reduce to the background. And then this is also the peak um, identified in uh, GTAX. So using this kind of signal, we can roughly identify um, 30,000 ERA candidate peak in core enhancer region. So this core enhancer only five megabits. And then what we want to know is how is this ERA regulates? So when you superimpose this together, you see this ERA peak, they are, uh, you see tandem TF binding motif on the both side. So this is very, um, clear signal, you have certain enriched in transcription factor flanking the TRN region form to this. Um, so this also indicate that's really mean not only, not some random genome signal, it's really capture some uh, enrichment in nearby region. So, but we did not see any splicing. So indicate this ERA peak is not due to some misannotated um, exon. So then why you, um, Super, we then collect those uh, nucleosome profile based on NMNA sequencing. We collect this public um, nucleosome profile for 29 tissue. So because when you have super enhancer, um, in, when you have uh, super enhancer usually active in certain tissue, but when you have the signal across um, different tissue, in the most majority case, you still see a um, occupancy of nucleosome. Indicate that there's a nucleosome exactly corresponding to the that enhancer peak. So it seems that ER expression is largely regulated by well-positioned nucleosome peak, nucleosome. So um, when a specific tissue, when this ER open, uh, this nucleosome of this region become available, uh, in a certain tissue, this enhancer turn off, this region essentially closed by run up a um, nucleosome. And interesting, we found those position nucleosome, they are, although they are not conserved in sequence, but we also have some nucleosome in cross different species, say in mouse and pigs, you see those nucleus position, it quite conserved uh, in evolution. So we now can see that enhancer, short enhancer peak, they're regulated by the dynamic well positioned conserved uh, nucleosome. So that's really how this important regulatory. So this is similar to um, the transcription side. We also have this well-positioned nucleosome. So what I'm saying is uh, in the ERA peak, you also have this well-positioned nucleosome as a epigenetic control. So taking this together, uh, we have this nucleosome binding on the transcription initiation. So we believe this um, in the genome, there's a well-positioned nucleosome when this fully occupied region, that ER signal just turn off. Uh, when the enhancer open, um, that nucleosome fall off, the region become available. Nearby transcription finding site will help recruit some uh, transcription factor initiate. When this doing, they use the ER signal. Okay, so now when we have this core region, the next one, so far I have two important observations, right? One is a super enhanced region contain this multiple enhancer units, generate ERA, very short ERA. Second one is this kind of ERA, they coincident with well positioned nucleosome. So we can based on these two principles, perform a systematic analysis. Basically, uh, we extended this to the last majority, nearly 300 megabits, tissue specific enhancer region where we identify um, 300,000 super enhancer region. Um, by doing that, essentially we can quantify super enhancer map. So basically we put that 370 uh, megabits region, based on our seek data, we first can nearly identify 4 billion ERA peak. And then we can super incorporate the um, nucleosome binding bending data across different tissue through a PCA you basically found um, there's a PCA1, 2, 3, especially the PCA3. That really corresponding to the nucleosome occupancy. So an active 
value of the PCA3 essentially meaning that position have well positioned um, nucleosome. So based on that, we can identify the uh, super enhancer location. And then if you incorporate this location, uh, to, uh, superimpose those together, together you see, um, you see a very strong uh, ER signal peak by cage. So that's really help you validate our RNA-based uh, ERA location through an independent uh, platform. So the reason why we believe enhancer type the signal is really uh, important for our study uh, cancer. So because we believe that enhancer provide a natural solution to address tumor heterogeneity. So you know, um, when we study tumor, bulk tumor, essentially it's a mixture of different um, cell type. So nowadays people using single cell to generate, to do single cell, but that's still expensive and limited to um, research domain. But we can ask the question, how can we really quantify those um, heterogeneity? One way is you can imagine this bulk sample, they have different cell type. Each cell type have their specific transcription profile, but this enhancer largely determine the cell type specific uh, transcription profile. So if we do bulk level correlation, so here, as you can see um, in this, um, suppose you have a phenotype, you do bulk level correlation. Um, so suppose given the phenotype we are interested in, this phenotype only controlled by a specific cell type, say cell type A. So if we do that uh, cell type A signal, that's a gene type signal, and then you have enhancer gene expression. If you really um, do that cell type, you see a very strong correlation. But when you do this bulk sample, you essentially average the signal across different cell type. So that's why you largely see, um, because for example, in enhancer cell type B and cell type C, the correlation is very weak. So when you do the bulk sample level correlation, um, you have this um, very weak or no correlation. So that's why we believe instead of doing gene level, gene level um, genotype phenotype correlation, you can move one type of higher do that enhancer level correlation. And because the enhancer have this intrinsic cell type specific feature, they automatically tease out a lot of heterogeneity confounding effect in your analysis. So I can give you one example. Uh, for example, there's a Hugo et al. paper where they generate a um, bunch of advanced myeloma patient. Um, they gave them the same TD1 treatment. And there's only 30 patient have respond, responding. The other 70 people don't have the response. And then this study generates this um, RNA-seq data. But if you do the RNA level analysis, essentially you found the nodes here show the p-value distribution between responding group and um, non-responding non group. Because here you basically see a uniform p-value meaning given um, um, multiple testing correction, there's no significant hits in that differential gene expression. But when you do this um, enhancer-based analysis, indeed you see a significant peak where they indicate after even correct for FDR, you see uh, 164 enhancer locus show significant strong signal. And then if you look at this based on the super enhancer ER signal, they really can classify patient into um, different group complete response and non-response group. And then if you look at the enhancer RNA, their nearby gene, you found that they are enriched in these two um, gene sets. One is exhausted T cell, um, the other um, in that um, non-response group, and then the other is expanding um, T cell in that good response group. So that's perfectly explained what we observed. So that's, uh, and also this ER based signal also help you not only predict CDL1, uh, they also help you predict the response for anti CTL4 uh, enhancer signal. So this just give you one example where you have the same data, you did not really find a significant signal in RNA based analysis, but when you see 
significant signal in enhancer, and then that help you explain the biology behind that clinical response. So um, what I'm saying is um, this is super enhancer. What I show you is raw analysis super enhancer contain that uh, individual ER signal featured by sharp ERA peak, and then such an ER locus regulated by dynamic well-positioned nucleosome. And this raw study will provide a high resolution enhancer R locus. The, um, so super enhancer activity can be easily quantified by RNA seq data. And we further show ER signal provide a better explanation power on quantitative traits beyond gene inspection. And then I just want to uh, thank, so this first part is really uh, my fellow Jun Li uh, lead this analysis and then Hu Chen, um, Yu Meng and Mei Ru. My second part is really uh, my super postdoc uh, Han Chen do this enhancer analysis. He's amazing guy really make this uh, um, single-handed analysis of enhancer. And also I want to thank all my um, grant funding to give me um, support. And I will stop here. I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Han. That was awesome. Really great. Tons of data and a bunch of questions uh, already. The first one I think is, can Dr. BioWrite output the code? Can you like actually get a, a version of the source code that was used to generate all the analyses, all the figures, stuff like that, so that you could make it available as like a GitHub or part of a paper? Yes, that's exactly what we are working on. Actually, one way we hope the bioinfiltration group can, um, we try to make some smart API, try to, you already get the code, so can automatically install that in Dr. Bell, right? Yeah, so once you have, that's actually our platform really help bioinfiltration to um, emote, uh, encourage more people to use their tool. Yeah, we are working on that. So far, we, we, uh, we haven't reached the automatic step in them. That's very cool. A second question on, on, on Mr. BioWrite is, um, you could imagine it being dangerous. Somebody could go through and verbally say, check gene one, check gene two, check gene three. Keep on asking questions and implicitly do a huge amount of multiple testing correction without doing it in a kind of formalized way. How do you think about balancing, making sure people do good statistics with making the analyses really easy to use? Yeah, so that's always a Big question. So regardless which platform you, you're doing things, so people maybe do the same thing, say using CBEL. So we, we are actually now working on some more intelligent way. For example, uh, first of all, we make the report available so people know exactly the detail whether the p-value is correct. Number two, when, you, when we do some pan cancer analysis, we automatically report some FDR. I think for um, individual tests later, if you have certain pattern, remember our doctorate had a way to record patient user data. We may automatically have some conversation say, hey, do we want to consider multiple testing correction to sort of reminder people, maybe you should consider uh, correction multiple test. Yeah. So that's really step-by-step. Step. We try to get such kind of feedback, make more uh, scientific robust. That makes a lot of sense. I'm really glad you thought about that deeply. Um, a third question is, you know, big picture, what do you think are the key gaps in the data that exists to enable something like Mr. BioWrite, or for that matter, like the second half of your talk to be done more effectively? What, where would you encourage people to be thinking about new data generation where it's more important than data analysis? So I think the make the data well annotated and then make the data public available is really important. Um, so one goal for us, from all my group we try to do is sort of promote the shared data, shared algorithm, and also lower the bar for data analysis. I think a lot of people have the motivation to try to do some analysis, but because there are limitation, they really have that great question, but it's very hard to allocate a bioinformatic collaborator on bioinformatics to, to do the analysis because everyone is busy, it's hard to find a collaborator. But my motivation is really make this bar as easy as you speak. When you speak out the question, you can begin to do the analysis. In future, I think when somebody for the data um, generation should have the data, 
well documented in terms of their generation process and their annotation. So we can make more standardized. So for like Dr. Barrett, we can direct a lot of API to automatically get the data, get the annotation provided. Yeah. And maybe uh, I think the last question that we got is, tell me a little bit, oh, another one just came in, but tell me a little bit about how you think about integrating functional and chemical genomic data, CRISPR, drug screening data with um, primary or metastatic cancer data um, in Mr. BioRay. Do you think about those as sort of different analyses that you just- No, I think that I think it's Go for it. Yeah, I think it's not the same. So no, we are actually going to in, incorporate the deep map data. So people can easily ask mm -hmm. the question, whether this gene is essential gene, not gene. So I think that nowadays there are so many databases, so many data resources, regardless whether it's functional data, metabolic data, or um, even as long as it's big data, our bifurcation essentially can make that uniform. And then the fundamental way to analyze is still the same. You have the data set, understand the data quality, and then have the analytical script, do the analysis, and found the appropriate visualization module to show the result. That's still the step one, two, three. Mm -hmm. I think regardless of how different data type, how come it's still the three big basic question. I think um, our doctorate essentially equipped it to do all this kind of analysis. Yeah. The only mm -hmm. thing is yeah, we have to start with certain analysis where my group have strong domain knowledge so we can quick jump up. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You basically just need a module to extend anything like that. Two yeah. questions, two more questions that came in. One mm -hmm. is when you were referring to um, enhancers and you were thinking about EQTLs, you, you sometimes called them causal. How do you confirm causality there? Is it an inference or is it something that you can do experimentally? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very good question. So as I mentioned, when you have two genes, two things correlated, they either correlated by causal effect, A cause B, on B cause A, on A and B correlated with C, right? So mm -hmm. as I mentioned, the EQTL signal actually help us differentiate this because when you have SNP in enhancer region, if they show a EQTL signal, that means that's really enhancer how the causal effect. Because in the other two model, you would not see that kind of signal. So of course, once we now prioritize certain causal effects, as I show, we use the CRISPR in cell line, we knock out that enhancer region confirmed this is really a causal effect. Yeah. Thank you. And our last questions from uh, Jason Ernst, so I don't know if you're meeting with, but he, he wondered, um, if you could contrast what you get from enhancer RNA analysis with kind of classic attack seek analysis, how do they, are they complementary, duplicative? Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So for, we're working on patient data. Um, so when we're on patient data, very attack seek on patient data. So we haven't do that comparison. But what I'm saying is even for attack seek, it's still much less uh, available than RNA seq. So essentially, I think you, but the problem for a taxi, they give you a big region. So, which region is open? You can only know that it's very hard to get a quantified signal from region because we never have this big region, the background noise will be. Our enhancer map, the cool thing is, it's very, each locus only 100 BP long. So, you have precise location. You can quantify that get a very quantitative measurement. That's how you do downstream phenotype correlation. Yeah. Got it. Thank you kindly. That was awesome. Um, anybody who had additional questions, feel free to get uh, contact Han directly or email me and I'll link you to him. Uh, and thank you so much. That was an thank awesome. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.